All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover um, a variety of topics that we of interest to libraries. Um, Encompass Live is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's okay. We do record the show every week and it is then posted to our website for you to watch. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can see our archives and get to them there. Um, we post into the archives the recording of the show and any um, slides, like here's the presentation that, <clears throat> excuse me, Amanda has this morning. Um, we'll have a link to that for you as well. So if there is anything in these slides that you see that you want to, um, websites or things that is mentioned. Don't worry about trying to scribble down all the URLs or anything like that. You'll have access to this afterwards as well. Um, we uh, both the live show and the archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with anyone you may think may be interested in any of our topics, friends, family, neighbors, colleagues um, out there. Um, all of our archives are there um, and if people can watch them or any of our upcoming shows, let people know about them and have, um, encourage them to register. Um, we do a mixture of things on the show, uh, book reviews, interviews, demos of products and services, mini training sessions, uh, basically anything that may, we think may be of interest to libraries. Um, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in the state of Nebraska, and that is all types of libraries. So we have topics for uh, public, academic, K-12 schools, uh, correctional facilities, museums, uh, we are all over the board. Um, libraries is really our only criteria. <laughs> Pretty wide ranging there. Um, we do bring in guest speakers sometimes to speak on Encompass Live from around the, the state of Nebraska and across the country. Um, but we also have sessions done by our own uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff. And that is what we have today. Yes. <laughs> uh, Next to me this morning is Amanda Sweet. She is our Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> and uh, she's been in that position a year yet? How long? How long? I can't remember now. <laughs> Feels like forever. Yes. <laughs> Recently, within the last year or so, was, yeah. yeah. But I was actually uh, promoted up to that. And she recently, last month, attend right it was just last month yes, yes april mm -hmm. yeah i've got right on the screen here attended the computers and libraries conference in washington dc and well specifically was in virginia this year yeah yeah, went to, yeah. they vary in the dc area we'll call it <laughs> and she's gonna uh share with us some cool things that she learned um at computers and libraries so i'm just gonna hand it over to you to take it away tell All us right. everything you need to know in an hour <laughs> pressure's in an hour <laughs> Right. So first, I'd like to start off by kind of covering what it actually is that I do. So a lot mm -hmm. of the questions that I got both at the conference and as I've been traveling around doing some training for makerspace stuff is technology innovation librarian is a bright, shiny term, but what does it actually mean? So it's a giant game. I need to click onto it to get Yeah, I should be able to. So what I actually do is reach out to people and reach out to different libraries and find out what they're looking for. I find out when you give me a call and say, this is a project I've been thinking about, um, would you be able to help me out with that? First, I'm going to start asking you a few questions about what your library needs are, what your target audience is. Um, what you've done in the past, what you're looking to do in the future, and kind of find out what might work well with your library and your patrons. And sometimes it's hard to ask for what you actually want because you don't know it exists yet. Mm -hmm. So another thing I do is try to track emerging tech trends. I go on like TechCrunch, I go on CNET, I go on all across mm -hmm. the internet, across different conferences and things like that. And I try to find out what's worth pursuing um, and when to implement it, how to implement it. Basically, I learn a whole bunch of stuff so I can work with you and make things happen. And I also 
go through and build different tutorials. Sometimes it's on request, sometimes it's just something that I think different libraries will need. Mm -hmm. And uh, one I'm working on in particular is um, WordPress tutorials. Oh, sure. Yeah, because of the um, library, the library the libraries on the web that we have. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of revamping mm -hmm. that site right now to try to update a little bit and give you the information that will actually help you out. I know WordPress does lots of updates and it can be frustrating that you learned how to do something yeah. and then they change it all. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing to me? <laughs> I learned how to do that a year ago and now it's different. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So that's what one of the things I'm working on right now. And so right now, the purpose of this presentation is to give you a better idea of what I just found out is out there. A lot mm -hmm. of this stuff you're going to find out that you've probably already heard about, mm -hmm. but some of these presentations gave a new spin on it, mm -hmm. gave different applications for it, and we'll just show you some possibilities. So a few of the things that we covered are, you'll notice that there's an exclamation point after robots. I love robots, <laughs> they're awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, and there's also a lot of um, geospatial based apps that are out there. Um, there are some apps that you can download that will let you load in pictures and descriptions so that as, say for example, a patron walks into the library, they have their smart device on there and they walk up to the reference desk and say, what did the library used to look like in 1920? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can actually build a historical tour of your library so that as the patron walks through and they hit certain geographical locations within the library, a picture or a description will pop up. Of what it used to be. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So that's kind of something that uh, one of the presenters was toying around with, and they actually repurposed an existing app to kind of fit that new need. And they've also used a, a similar concept to kind of map out the location of different call numbers in the library. So if you have like a four-story library and you want to be able to tell patrons that are just walking in the door, um, this is where your book is, open up this app and this is how you can get to it. And if you're really mm -hmm. fancy, you can also, and you have a strong Wi-Fi connection, you can do the tracking that'll say, turn left here at oh, this stack. Oh, like, like your GPS and your Google Maps exactly. or something. Yeah. Saying, turn yeah. left at half a mile ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that won't, your library won't be that big, but yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> 10 steps ahead. Yeah. And this isn't new. It's been around, but it's we're gaining more applications for it. And now that people are starting to become more aware of it, mm -hmm. you can do a lot more with it. And VR, virtual reality, is huge right now. Um, there's still a lot of kinks to work out with the system, um, namely disorientation. Um, Mm -hmm. I guess the biggest thing I equate with virtual reality is we all fall down because you put on this virtual reality headset, the screen is about maybe two to three inches away from your head mm -hmm. and you start turning your head and you start exploring a virtual world. So your brain is engaged with this world but not engaged with the physical space around you. Mm -hmm. So you start taking three steps forward into virtual reality and trip over a chair in real <laughs> reality. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of, there's open source options for VR and there is, I'll get more into that a little bit later on. But you can just take a quick review of this and we'll just get started on some of the more specifics of the possibilities. Of course, I start out with robots. Mm -hmm. And the picture that you see on the slide here is from the Dash and Dot, right? And a lot of you may have already seen this, um, but the presentation that I went to, Dashing to Code by Cynthia Cookson, she covered a lot of the, she made a lot of worksheets for different age ranges to be able to apply this robot in either schools or in the library. And she is more than willing to share these. So if you want to go to the Computers and Libraries website or even just reach out to her, she's, she's awesome. I talked to her after the presentation. 
And so something that I thought about during that presentation is do people, do high school students, do adults, does everyone know that when you pull up this um, wizard that'll let you program your robot, there's a code behind that. So um, if you've ever used the Lego Mindstorms, which is the one that we use for through Lacquer Innovation Studios, right. whenever you, it'll pull up um, an app and it'll let you go, I want this robot to move forward. So you click and you drag up a block and then you change the settings on there to say, I want this robot to go forward for three seconds. But there's a code behind that. And it links into a Linux-based computer that's connected onto the robot. And it just interpret, it automatically interprets that into the code, which is what the Linux-based computer operates on. Mm -hmm. And students are interested in that. They don't always want to just go, that's a cool wizard. Why don't they just stop there? Yeah, they want to know what made it work. Yeah. Why did this? Yeah. And that's what these robots are supposed to be teaching kids or anybody using it is the code and not just here's exactly. the, I mean, you said robots are cool which is a totally true thing of course um but and it's fun for a bit but yeah it's supposed to be saying and how do we make it do this thing yeah we have the control and here's all the what's behind the scenes there yeah so i did a little more research into robots and specifically the lego mindstorms because that happens to be the one that we use we have yeah we have access to those here yeah so I found out some of the major coding languages that they use if students or anyone wanted to hack their bot. Lego um, chose Linux because it's easy to hack. Mm -hmm. And so they have, um, Lego started putting together different options to hack in using Python, you can use Java, you can use, they actually have this huge resource available online that'll show you uh, which coding language you prefer. You can choose the coding language you prefer. And then there's a an app that you can interact with that will let you learn more and work more with that. It's easier if you go onto the website and I can add that as a resource later on because I forgot to put it on the slide here. <laughs> sure. That's but, on the Lego Mindstorms website. That's the Lego Mindstorms, so yeah. yeah. Um, EV3 Dev, I think, I'm pretty sure is the uh, address for it, but I'll double check. But kids want to learn more about this. There's like a thirst for knowledge about this. And as librarians, we want to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. We don't need to know how to use Python, but we can tell them where to go to learn it. And That's how we do most of our jobs. Exactly. I have no idea what that is, but let's find out for you. Yeah. <laughs> And then after you learn Python, maybe you want to use, you want to learn C++ and you want to start building your own robot. And you can do it even just out of found objects. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the tutorials that I would love to actually get time to put together. How to build your own robot yep. out of yeah. something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully soon. Anyway, moving right along. We already covered a lot of this during my review of some of the initial possibilities. But I mean, you can do the historical tours and, oh, and you can also partner with um, different museums. So for example, we have a lot of historical museums that are dotted across Nebraska. And this could be an awesome resource for them if they don't have the funds to actually get more physical objects in their space. You can supplement what's there already with the virtual tour. And it also gives you more flexibility in your exhibits and flexibility in how much you can cover and when. And now we're back to virtual reality. Um, you'll see on the headset that's on the right over there, it says OSVR. That stands for Open Source Virtual Reality. Oh, cool. And it's not a perfect system yet. They're working on it. They're still working on it. But it's available with um, a lot of development toolkits to be able to not necessarily build your own headset, but be able to play around with the uh, 
so I don't want to get that much into how VR actually works, mm -hmm. like because this is only an hour. That could be a whole different show. <laughs> yeah, but it'll give you more flexibility in trying to build your own games and how to how virtual reality actually works. And I also found um, at during my research, I found that there are three high school students in France and their teacher who built their own virtual reality headset wow. because they couldn't afford the $700 plus Oculus Rift. Right. So I thought that resource is out there. Why don't we do mm -hmm. it? So that's kind of another thing that I've had in the back of my mind, just mm -hmm. kind of stirring around back there. But, and there's also a one-on-one -on -one tech assistance here. So this kind of goes along with the same vein of we don't need to have all the answers right away. Half of them, one-on-one -on -one tech assistance is showing people what you did to find the answer. Mm -hmm. And empower them to find it themselves later. Exactly. <laughs> Ref us <desk> one-on-one. <laughs> yeah. And so say, for example, you want to teach someone how to use their smartphone device. You can, you pretty much already know how to Google and find out what's out there. Um, you can go to the, like, say for example, you have a smart, uh, Samsung Galaxy, you can go to the Samsung Galaxy, they have forms that'll show you to do that. Patrons don't necessarily know this exists already. Mm -hmm. And you can just kind of help them out by pointing them in the right direction and showing them you can even put together a um, reference, like a ref style information sheet that'll say, this is the route that I went through to find this answer. This is the source and different things like that. And in order to justify starting a program like that, it's important to track what you actually help patrons with. So say for example, you do manage to convince your library to be able to start this one-on-one -on -one assistance to help with handheld devices, to help with um, a printer that they might have at home, with um, different tech that they come across in their everyday lives. We can't cover everything. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. There's, it's too much stuff. But we can build a spreadsheet of what we did help people with. And then we can tell we can justify continuing or starting this program by saying we helped 31 patrons this month with their Samsung Galaxy or with their smartphone. And, or we helped um, 42 patrons in the last four months with their um, HP PC. But there's possibilities. And you can also go to the Computers and Libraries website, and Jason Pinshower has his presentation slides that are available on there. And now, this was kind of a cool thing that I came across. Um, this is also definitely not entirely new, but there's mm -hmm. new applications for it. Mm -hmm. So the Library of Things, um, it can be the library that was doing the presentation um, Arlesboro, and I'm probably horribly mispronouncing this, mm -hmm. but they actually had um, household devices. So they had a cake pop maker and they had a oh. like a so bread maker. Appliances that you don't use like yeah. regularly, so yeah. if you want to invest in them at your house, you use it like once a year or less. Exactly. Yeah, that's cool. Then it was, you know, cake pans, of course, have been a very common thing, like yeah. just the pans, because, you know, your kid is really into um, Thomas the Tank Engine this year, um, so you're going to make a cake this time, but next year they don't, they want Power Rangers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's always something. Yeah. <laughs> but, and it doesn't have to be incredibly expensive stuff. Um, during the presentation, they mentioned that they got a lot of it from Goodwill, and mm -hmm. Apparently, there's a lot of people who get cake pot pans for Christmas and then decide they don't have a use for it, so they mm -hmm. take it to Goodwill and it's almost brand new. Mm -hmm. But they do have good applications for it. And a cake pot pan doesn't necessarily have to be just for cake pots. It can be for school projects or it can be for 
making perfect spheres out of clay. Of anything. That you need something yeah. around, yeah. yeah. But it's mainly putting the item in front of people so that they can let the imagination take over and use different applications for something they may have never imagined before. Mm -hmm. And in the same vein as that, there's tap kits. So these can be a wide variety of price points. Um, so right now with the Library Innovation Studios, we have the Arduino Uno. Mm -hmm. And that is basically a little circuit board that you can use to, you can connect a light bulb and a battery to it to close a circuit and make the light bulb light up. Mm -hmm. But the Arduino, do, the Arduino Uno costs maybe $25, $30. You can also get a roll of copper tape, a piece of cardstock, a battery, and a light bulb, and get the exact same thing. thing. <laughs> so there's more than one way to do things. And if you were to just grab those things from any hobby store using your 40% off Joanne Fabrics coupon, which I just <laughs> used last weekend, <laughs> there you go, yeah. <laughs> then you can do the exact same thing for a lot cheaper, and you can reach more libraries by doing it. And you can also, if you happen to magically have the funding or find a grant, there's a lot of different sources out there that you can put together little tubs full of tech kits and mm -hmm. mail them out to libraries across the state or mail them. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you know how the book club kit works through the, mm -hmm. um, through the commission here, it right. works essentially the same way. But there's a lot of different applications for it. Um, you basically just do the advertising, let people know that it exists, and then set up a policy saying, this is how we're going to handle damaged items, this is how we're going to handle... Um, There's all that practical behind the scenes things that you have to right. be, yeah, yeah. plan for. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned grants and things for these to get something more, more pricey or expensive. Mm -hmm. Anything nowadays related to STEM or STEAM, they're added mm -hmm. in betting arts back into it, depending on which acronym you want to use, is really popular now and lots of grants that will be giving money specifically to those kinds of projects definitely so if that's something you can come up with um and put it in that kind of vein you could definitely get some funding from various various sources to put these together for your own library and have i got the projects for you <laughs> but and i love the free online tools here mm -hmm. um I had no idea that there was a database out there that would let me look up the entire um, script from an episode of The Simpsons. <laughs> but okay, it was awesome. The whole script, sure. Yeah, if you needed to know who said what when. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's also more practical applications like um, finding out the colors from a website if you're trying to mm -hmm. design. Like in your middle of, of designing, it'll pull up the There's options in there. <laughs> if you find something that you like and you want to replicate it yeah. or something, yeah. yeah. And you want to find out the number correspondence of what that color actually is so you can pop mm -hmm. it into your code. And then you can also you can also find out the fonts of different websites. Mm -hmm. um, I checked out this tool and it works most of the time. <laughs> but as with anything, it gets close enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm kind of working on building a list of um, useful online resources, um, partially based on what I heard from Laura Solomon, who she found some pretty creative stuff in there. That was pretty good. And just a few that I came across previously or that I heard about. Um, the internet mm -hmm. is a huge and grand, wonderful place. Yeah. But it's hard to find the time to poke around and see what's actually out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the thing. There's so many free tools or tools that have free, ver that you might have heard of that were pay, but still have a free version of it. Yeah. That for yeah. many of the things that we do in libraries is plenty. You don't need okay. to pay necessarily for the level that gets you the, the business version or whatever they call it on there. You know, even sometimes there's an educational version of some of these tools that you've thought of that would be too much, you know, you don't, you can't pay for that. There, there's all so many things out there, yeah. 
And one I recently came across was um, Blueberry Software has a free version of a screen recorder with an audio option. Mm -hmm. So when you're recording tutorials, you don't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. It'll let you do it for free. There's Blueberry Software and Blueberry Software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll send you the Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. And we all know we've seen these they're everywhere mm -hmm. but this presentation took a new slant on it mm -hmm. um, she talked more about different applications for using gifs depends on who you listen to GIF, yeah gif the creator of it says it's gif i'll go with that yes yeah. but, it but stands people have their opinions yeah <laughs> Basically, however you say it, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> but it stands for graphics interchange format. And there's multiple different ways that you can put it together. Um, I put Giphy on here because it's a popular mm -hmm. site. It's easy to use. It's free. And there's all, but you can also, if you're making a still image instead of just an animation, 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 <laughs> then you can also use something like GIMP or anything like that. And if you haven't already made a GIF before, it's basically, there's a few different ways you can do it. You can take a series of um, still frame images and then compile them together to make an animation, sort of like you would do stop motion. Or you can also take a snippet of a video and just pull that out and overlay text over it. Mm -hmm. Or you can take a still frame image, like the one that's in the upper right there, mm -hmm. and you can just overlay text over it. Or you can load it into a website called like Giphy, or if you, if you basically, if you Google GIF generator, mm -hmm. they're everywhere. Actually, I looked it up and I was wrong. I had it backwards because it's hard to remember. The creator of the um, format, graphics interchange format, did declare in 2013 that it should be pronounced like GIF, like the brand of peanut butter. Huh. Not with a hard G. But people still argue about it and say he's wrong, which I you know, don't really understand because he's the creator. He should be the end. Yeah. Um, but no. <laughs> people all listen. So... Oh, but the Oxford it. English Dictionary, he also, also mentioned the Oxford English does accept both pronunciations, yeah. GIF or GIF, but he says it's GIF. Yeah. <laughs> podcasting. Oh, yes. yeah. So podcasting has been around for a while. Um, the term podcasting is kind of a, it's a merge between broadcasting and iPod podcast mm -hmm. and so it's kind of taken off recently you can do usually it's a series of um, audio or you can also add video to it you can use it to build tutorials to do marketing you can um, you can also put out um, as you're doing tutorials you can send out podcasts to say I just updated this and this is what you can look out for in the future. Mm -hmm. um, you can do informational stuff. You can do outreach. Possibilities are pretty much endless. Mm -hmm. Podcasts to me, I kind of think, because I know some people are don't know what they are or were. just don't get it. I kind of think them as, because you mentioned you can add video, but typically a podcast is just audio. Yep. So it's similar to a... And, so, a radio show but available online yeah so that you can listen to on your devices um, like you do you listen to an audiobook you could listen to your podcasts from your phone yeah. um, as opposed to what we do here on encompass live which is a combination of audio and video which people are calling either webcasts webcasts because you add in the the visual and the slides um, or websites or webinars uh, has varying terms yeah when you add in the visual part of it, yeah. Technicalities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, and a lot of them you can post to your own website or you can go to a third party website. 
And so if you don't want to worry about hosting your own site, but you still want to get your stuff out there, um, there are options for mm -hmm. doing that as well. And if people are interested, I can start building kind of like a start to finish, like building a conceptualizing your idea, building a theme, making sure it actually fits with your audience mm -hmm. and kind of getting the word out there and then finding out where to post it and then post marketing too. But as you can see, there's there's quite a few tutorials that I had in mind. <laughs> there's only so much time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but and you can also add a music backdrop to the podcast. But that that's gets people tricky. do like a little intro. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do intro music. Um, I've seen some of the music based podcasts that are out there. People have added a low music track to the background of the entire thing. Um, they, Thing. Thing. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. I love, I'm just love hate relationship with it too. I've seen <laughs> it work and I've seen it not work. So yeah. depends how adventurous you want to be. Usually, I've seen it as they you find um uh, not free uh un, not copyrighted little snippets snippets of music or public access yeah. public domain yeah. music. Just give yourself a little intro. You know, this is our this is our theme music, and it's just for the first ten seconds, and then you go into your yeah. talk or whatever you're talking about. Generally, sort of like with what audiobooks do sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you yeah. know. But possibilities. Mm -hmm. And now yeah, makerspace, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you've heard about Library Innovation Studios, and I'm sure that a lot of you have, it is Nebraska's the Library Commission's version of the makerspace movement. So we basically got a collection of four sets of different equipment that are traveling around Nebraska. And they go to different libraries for 20 week intervals. And the trainers here at the Library Commission and at UNL, we go out and train librarians on how to use the equipment. But maker spaces are basically just making stuff it doesn't have to be super tacky it can be you can either you can even just use a craft room if you want to do that it doesn't have to be the most expensive thing on the planet or it can be upwards of thousands of dollars it just depends on what you have at your disposal and how ambitious you want to get but there's so much you can do with it and they've been around for a while, so there's resources out there. Oh, yeah. And I know we were talking about before, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can just go through, it feels like Google knows all, because it collect. like you can go through, search for the information, and just tweak policies and tweak instruction mm -hmm. to fit what you need. Yeah, our library innovation studios, there's, um, I think a total of 30 libraries in the state that are part of the program that are getting these um, the, the equipment we have. But we have on our website, we are posting all the information about this equipment, what it is, the, the model, the brand, um, the specifics of what it can do, videos of how to use it, yeah. um, instructional guides on how to you know use it in your library. So, uh, I mean, we've got ours up there. You're saying don't have to reinvent the wheel and figure out what do I do? What do I, you know, how do I teach somebody this? Go to our websites if you want the same thing because of what we have and borrow our stuff and use it. <laughs> yeah. You know, change the logo, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Uh, you know, give us credit saying, hey, we got this idea or this info from there. But um, yeah, you're going to find a lot. You don't have to start from scratch anymore. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. is great. And now that makerspaces have been around for a while, they're starting to evolve more. You'll see on the slide it says evolving into solve spaces. What a solve yeah. space is, it's like the next level of makerspace. So you know how I was talking before about the robotics? Mm -hmm. A lot of makerspaces now are just kind of showing kids, this is a robot, this is sort of how it works, this is how you can build a program to make it go through an obstacle course. Mm -hmm. A solved space would be showing them how to hack the bot. 
showing them advanced level projects that they can do to reach the next level. And you can even start, I can ramble on a lot about this, <laughs> but I won't, <laughs> you know. But you can also, you can start building different tech kits that are related to this as well. Mm -hmm. And start building different tutorials, partnering up with other libraries and reaching out to find out what's already been done, what could be done. Um, basically just gathering information into one spot and finding out different possibilities. Like, um, and also telling people that this is what this machine is, but this is how it can be used in real life. Mm -hmm. This is how it's being yeah. used on a grander scale. I'll use the example here of our 3D printer. Our 3D printer is about 21 inches by 21 inches, if I'm remembering right, give or take. And so it kind of, it's somewhat limiting as to what you can print on there. Oh, it's something so big. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or you can build something modular. True. And put it together. Pieces, yeah. Like um, if you got really ambitious, you could actually print the pieces to build your own vacuum robot. And then you could learn how to code it using either Python or C++ and then teach people how to do that. That would be awesome. The moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there, the possibilities are endless out here. And I just went to, I was actually just at a training a different library yesterday. And mm -hmm. I had just showed them how to use the 3D printer. And I had showed them how to get to Thingiverse that has all the mm -hmm. different pre-made 3D objects. But then, one of the, there was a teenage volunteer there who asked, well, how can I make my own? So I showed him Tinkercad. And I actually, we wound up spending the second half of the session just playing with Tinkercad. <laughs> <laughs> and I showed him how to pull in an item from Thingiverse and manipulate it using Tinkercad. Or mm -hmm. you can use SketchUp, which is powered by Google because Google knows all. They have everything. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but there's different options out there. You just want to look at things as a, an open possibility. Mm -hmm. And so I also added in at the end of the 3D printer that um, what, they're doing, what they're doing in the future with 3D printing, like gel suspension. Mm -hmm. And they've yeah. also built an entire house using only 3D printing. Yep. And, yeah. And yeah. It must have taken forever. It, yeah, yeah. So that's the one thing, 3D printers, it's they're not quick yet. Yeah. Hopefully they will be, but no, if you're gonna make something, you're gonna be spending you'll be learning a lot of patience. Yeah. <laughs> and they're also making prosthetic limbs out of it. And um, MIT has a lot of things that they were using it for. They have their own really, really high-tech version of the makerspace that I won't even go, <laughs> you, know, you know, but there's a lot of things you can do. That's my main point here. And if you want help, give me a call. That's what I'm here Get for. you started, absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of, Hi. do we have questions? Okay. Awesome. So, does um oh did you want to show the um CIL website? You were gonna yeah. yeah. Um, it was over there. Um, you should be able to click down. I've got the. How did you put it? It's um. There we go. Yep. Cool. So this is the main computers and libraries website. Um, you can also get to it just again by googling computers and libraries 2018. And the presentations with the downloadable slides, not every presentation uploads in their slide, but there it are. It depends on the, each presenter, yeah. if they did or not. Yeah. So you just click on presentations, and if there's a blue link, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. And I also took notes on the sessions that I did go to. So if you do happen to have more questions about the specific sessions that I went to that I wasn't able to cover during this part, 
during this one hour session, then you can definitely feel free to give me a call. We can talk about it, compare notes. Send me Amanda. Amanda. Yeah. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions? Anything you want to ask Amanda about any of the things that she mentioned? Um, this was obviously not, as, as you said, not delving in to very deep to each of these topics, yeah. but just you know some of the highlights of things that were um, going on um, being presented at, at uh, computers and libraries. So if you have any questions about any of those things you want to know more details on, or anything about computers and libraries, or any of these things that you see here, there were obviously many, many other sessions. Yeah. Um, it's a three-day conference, or does that count? Pre-conference, I don't know. It was three day regular and it was five day free. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. yeah, three days is the standard. Yeah, the basic, but then there's, yeah. That's the one I want to is the three yeah. day. Mm -hmm. And it is an annual conference in the Washington, D.C. area. It varies each year. Sometimes they go to different hotels or conference centers, but this year it's specifically just nearby in Arlington, Virginia. Um, So if you have any questions, type into your questions section and um, Amanda can answer anything you want to know. Uh, I've actually attended Computers and Libraries uh, a few years ago, went for, oh gosh, I think I sort of maybe five or six years, I can't remember now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it is it is a good conference. Yeah, it is, um, it is you know, for us here in the Midwest, getting out to the coasts, you know, to, yeah. it can cost, you know, something. But um, it's it's nice that it's a smaller conference um, attendance-wise, as opposed yeah. to something like um, um, ALA or PLA, which are so many more people. Yeah. yeah, you can really get more focused on um, different sessions you want to be um, attend and, and learn more. The sessions are smaller. The just the groups of people there are smaller, so you can connect. I think easier yeah. with networking and in a you know with a smaller group. Um, and if anyone has any projects in mind that they had wanted to get a little bit of assistance on then you can definitely mm -hmm. either type it in now or you can give me a call and yeah call anything you're interested yeah. in um yeah reach out to me there uh, which have got very informative thank you <laughs> <laughs> um as we said this was just a little start and we definitely recommend going to the site here to see some of the presentations that were um were done so you can get more details It doesn't look like anybody is typing in anything desperate that they want to know now. While we were chatting, just waiting to see if anybody had anything. If not, that's fine. Um, you know where to find Amanda here at the Library Commission. Um, contact her if you have any questions about anything on the presentation, anything at computers and libraries, or if you want to do innovate with anything at your library. As you said at the beginning about what you job is here. <laughs> um, that's what she's for. So if you're looking for advice, input, um, guidance on any of those kind of things, um, she'll be doing that. And it's also with our um, Nebraska Libraries on the Web project, if you're looking for a website for your library, that's something that she's working on updating. I know we had, um, as I said, WordPress had some, we had training up on about that, but did need a little bit of, little bit of updating, I think. Yeah. Um, so our website for Nebraska Libraries on the web, if you go to it right now, mm -hmm. some of the videos are still a touch out of date because ah, yeah. it's been about, I think it was about 2014 that some of those were loaded in. Some new ones were created. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and WordPress has updated several times since mm -hmm. then. So right now I'm kind of building a few tutorials that are a little more general that might kind of... Mm -hmm account for a few of the updates that might happen in the near future. Right. And then also working on linking to resources that will be more current and will be updated more frequently. Don't reinvent the wheel, like we said. There we go. Find other places yeah. that are already yeah. keeping it. <laughs> you follow your own advice. That's good. There we go. <laughs> All right, all right. Well, it doesn't look anybody typed in anything right now, so I think that will be good. We'll wrap it up for today. Thank you very much, Amanda, for this. this is great. Um, I know I do look at computers and libraries, um, and they also have a uh, partner conference. I'm not sure in um, in, in uh, California, the the other one. Um, 
Uh, I totally blanked on what it is. The one in Monterey that they, they do. Yeah, rainbow today. So um, that I do um, just for ideas and things and what's going on uh, in in the uh, technology world. Internet librarian. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. Internet librarian is like the sister conference to computers and libraries on each coast. Internet Librarian is in Monterey, California. Computers and Libraries is in DC area, both run by Info Today Company and on each coast. And there's also Code for Live too. Mm -hmm. yep. Which I love that. Which is even more um well it's, it's you from the name of code, more yeah. techie. Yeah. yeah. Getting into coding tech. So if that's something you want to learn more about. All right. So I think we'll wrap it up for today. Um, we will have the presentation available. I have a link to that. Um, just email me that, the, whatever your link that would be like the sharing link. Yeah. That's cool. Um, and this will end up in the uh, recording. Um, I'm going to go to our Encompass Live website. And actually, if you can pick up the keyboard there, type in Encompass Live. Uh, and enter. And so far, Encompass Live, we're the only thing called this on the internet, yay, so far. <laughs> so you'll find our website here. Um, We'll have the recording, should be available to you this afternoon. This is our upcoming shows, our upcoming schedule. We can scroll down um, right after our uh, upcoming sessions, we have our archives. And this will get you our um, all of our archives. This is our most recent one, which we had. We just had a recording last week. They didn't do a presentation slides. They just had showed their website. But I think we had. Um, there we go. Yeah. So this one will have a link to presentation, link to recording available, and it will be here at the top of the list. These are um, most recent one at the top. Uh, Encompass Live. We are actually in our tenth year of the show. Wow. Uh, so we have here our archives going back all the way to the very beginning. Um, and I'm going to scroll down here. So if you have concern with that, close your eyes. And you get all the way to the bottom of this page. We do have our archives going all the way back to uh, the very beginning, 2009, um, here up on our YouTube channel. So if you wanted to, you can go all back to the, to the very beginnings of our show when we started. But do keep in mind, because this is going back to 2009, there is going to be some old, outdated information on here um, but everything has a date on it so you know exactly when it was broadcast live and when that information is, is was you know relevant for that time uh, but we do have everything there we will always keep everything there we're librarians we archive and save things that's what we do <laughs> so <laughs> they are there and they will stay there um, for as long as um, we can Let's so scroll back up to the top here. We also have a search feature here now on our archives. So if you want to find a, um, something about a specific topic, it will search for any um, um, in the title and the description, the presenters' names. Um, you can search the entire archives or just the most recent year if you're looking for something just new, um, if you want to. So um, this will be on here later this afternoon. I'll send an email out to everyone who attended today and everyone who registered, letting you know it's available, and also posting on our social media and website what that the new um, show is available. We are also on Encompass Live, or Encompass Live is also on Facebook. There it goes. So if you are a big Facebook user, give us a like over there and you'll be notified of what's going on with the show. I'll post here also when our recording is available. Here's one for today where I just reminded people to log in for today's show. Um, but we have all of our, we don't want to do that. Um, all of our previous um, sessions here. So anything, um, if you are do like to use Facebook, you'll get notified a couple of times a week what's going on with Encompass Live. Um, other than that, that will wrap up for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is the 2018 One Book, One Nebraska uh, title, Nebraska Presence, an Anthology of Poetry. This is our book for this year, um, a collection of poetry. And we will next week be talking about it and what's going on with that and things you can do in your library to um, start reading rooms, promote it, use it and in your area. Um, the editors of the book will be with us, Greg Kosmicki and Mary Kay Stillwell will be here with us next week um, talking about it. So definitely join us next week to learn all about Nebraska Presence and Anthology of Poetry and any of our other shows that we have here. As you can see, I've got mail booked up and a few come are, 
already finalized for June, July, and August. Keep an eye on our schedule. We'll be getting more um, added to there as they um, finalize shows. So other than that, thank you very much for being with us here, Amanda, coming all the way from the upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you everyone for attending. We'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.